buy the best and relax. When you come down to the junior miners, you can make an unbelievable amount of money. But you have to work way harder. You have to have a higher tolerance for risk. And you have to be able to endure volatility. That's not the same as risk. The junior mining index can fluctuate 15% the same way that you and I inhale and exhale. <laughs> for me, that doesn't matter. You know, it's all background noise. I don't care. But I've done it for 50 years. Most people, if they put $100,000 into a speculation and they wake up and see it down to $85,000, freak out. So people need to do some sort of self-assessment. Now, when you look at the junior miners as a sector, they're much riskier than the senior miners. If you merged every junior mining company in the world into one company, Junior Explorco, that company in a very good year would lose $2 billion. In a bad year, it would lose $8 billion. So how much should you pay for this sector? Should you pay eight times losses? 12 times losses? In a good market, 20 times losses? You get the point. Before you invest, consider this. From 2000 to 2010, gold prices surged sevenfold. Yet the Philadelphia Gold and Silver Index saw a decline in free cash flow per share. Rick Rule emphasizes the importance of owning gold as insurance, but warns that not all gold investments are equal. Focus on high-quality companies like Franco Nevada, Wheaton Precious Metals, and Agnico Eagle. Rule advises against spreading investments too thinly and highlights the potential of junior miners for those willing to do the research. I want to say three things because there are three asset classes. Own gold as liquidity and as insurance. Right. Everybody right. needs to own gold. Flat out gold. Don't confuse yourself with gold stocks yet. Right. Uh, own gold and own it mm. as insurance. Own it and hope it doesn't go up in price. Think about other forms of insurance, life insurance. To get paid, you got to die, right? Think about gold in that context. Uh, although I think it might go to 8,000, I really hope I'm wrong. So now we've done gold. Right. The major gold stocks, uh, these are investments, but there's risk. You need to understand that these, well, they're gold companies, are also companies. They have to be efficient. Let me give your audience a sobering statistic. In the decade 2000 to 2010, an index of the largest uh, gold and silver mining companies in the world, uh, the XAU, uh, here's their performance. In the decade, the gold price went up sevenfold, and the free cash flow per share of the Philadelphia Gold and Silver Stock Index fell. The industry conspired to make less free cash flow per share after a sevenfold increase in the gold price than they did before. What that means is that if you invest in the sector, the whole sector, you're making a mistake. You have to invest in five or six companies that do a good job <laughs> of turning gold into profit. Uh, you have to invest not speculate, but invest for the five or six year term. Those names probably should include the best of the best. Uh, ironically, by the way, the best of the best won't be the best market performers. <laughs> the marginal ones, the nonsense ones uh, will be better speculations. But for investors around the gold price theme, you want high quality companies. You want Franco Nevada. You want Wheaton Precious. You want Agnico Eagle. Mm -hmm. If you can be a bit more speculative, you want the two big producers, Barrick and Newmont. Uh, and that's probably what you want. You want five or six or seven names. If you're prepared to work harder, uh, I, I can teach you how to expand your portfolio. But most people don't want to work harder. Most people want to play with their kids or grandkids, read books, garden. Uh, and these are all really, really, really good ideas about things to do with your time. So buy the best and relax. When you come down to the junior miners, you can make an unbelievable amount of money. But you have to work way harder. You have to have a higher tolerance for risk. And you have to be able to endure volatility. That's not the same as risk. A junior mining index can fluctuate 15%. The same way that you and I inhale and exhale. <laughs> For me, that doesn't matter. You know, it's all background noise. I don't care. 
but I've done it for 50 years. Most people, if they put $100,000 into a speculation and they wake up and see it down to $85,000, freak out. So people need to do some sort of self-assessment. Now, when you look at the junior miners as a sector, they're much riskier than the senior miners. If you merged every junior mining company in the world into one company, Junior Explorco, that company in a very good year would lose $2 billion. In a bad year, it would lose $8 billion. So how much should you pay for this sector? Should you pay eight times losses? 12 times losses? In a good market, 20 times losses? You get the point. If you invest in the sector, the whole sector, you will lose money. Mm -hmm. If you are willing to do the work to segregate the good from the bad and the ugly, what you'll find is that 5% of the 3,000 juniors listed worldwide generate such spectacular performance that they add legitimacy and sometimes luster to a sector that loses between 2 and $8 billion a year. But this is a function of work. People, if they can stomach the volatility and accept the risk, um, can make a lot of money on juniors. What they tend to do is follow that dictum that Doug Casey used to make so much fun of. Got a hunch, bet a bunch. I, I suggest to people that they own the same number of juniors that corresponds with the number of hours per month that they want to spend studying their their companies. So if you're willing to spend 10 hours a month, you know, taking that time away from your kids, your grandkids, whatever it is you do for a living, whatever it is that you enjoy, uh, then you can own 10 stocks. Sean, I've now graded over 80,000 portfolios uh, in a service that I'll talk to you about later. And one of the things I've learned is that most people own way too many stocks. It's common for junior mining portfolios to number between 30 and 60. It's common for the people who own those portfolios not to know anything about the companies that they're invested in other than the name. It's common that they've forgotten some of the names, in fact. Uh, and that contributes to the poor performance of the sector and the investors. So be in the juniors for sure if you are willing to work. Rick Rule shares his insights on precious metals bull markets, highlighting that gold typically leads the way, driven by fear-based buying. However, when general investors enter the space, silver often outperforms, going parabolic due to its smaller market. Rule recounts the dramatic rise of stocks like Silver Standard and Pan American Silver from mere cents to over $1.40. He advises using risk-tolerant capital for silver investments, noting that just 2% of his portfolio in silver stocks could potentially grow to 20-25% in five years. My experience has been that a precious metals bull market is always led by gold. Mm -hmm. The most motivated buyer is the fear buyer. And the gold buyer is a fear buyer. Mm -hmm. My experience has been that when we have a precious metals bull market, even a false start like we had uh, in 2000 to 2006 uh, or 1991 to 1996, the narrative is led by gold. But when the narrative is established for precious metals and the generalist investor comes in the precious metals space, silver goes crazy. <laughs> it goes parabolic. Uh, it moves later in the cycle, but it moves further and it moves faster. And the most volatile stocks in the sector, both to the upside and the down, are the silver equities. Doug Casey again points out that the universe of silver equities, at least legitimate silver equities, uh, is so small that when the generalist investor money comes into them, the market capitalizations literally can't contain the money. Let me give you some outrageous examples, Sean. Uh, in the mini market, if you will, that we enjoyed in from 1990 to 1996, uh, we underwrote Silver Standard, if my memory serves me right, at 72 cents with a warrant. Maybe the warrant was at a buck or a buck ten. Six years later, the stock was at $45. Uh, we underwrote Pan American Silver, I think, at 50 cents. And nobody wanted to be in silver when we were doing these. You know, the silver price per ounce was like three and a half or four dollars. The industry was in desolation. Uh, after six years, Pan American Silver was also trading above $40. Uh, 
That's the reason that you do this. You don't use money to speculate in silver stocks that you had set aside to pay for a child's college education. That isn't what you do. <laughs> you use money that is in an account that you can afford to lose a lot of, and you use money that if you are exposed to volatility that's up and down 15%, doesn't cause you to sleep, to lose sleep. Um, I'll, I'll quantify it for you, Sean. I have about uh, now 2% of my portfolio uh, in silver stocks. Mm -hmm. And if I'm right, I'm not saying I'm right, but if I'm right, uh, my suspicion is that five years from now, that 2 or 2.5% two of my portfolio will be at least measured against current portfolios, current portfolio values, 20 or 25%. Uh, if that portfolio gets cut in half, if I'm wrong, it's not going to change my decision as to what to have for breakfast. Right. Uh, if I'm right, it won't change my decision as to what to have for breakfast either, but it'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Here are the key takeaways from Rick Rule's insights. Own gold as insurance, not just as an investment. Be cautious with gold stocks and focus on top performing companies. Junior miners can offer high returns, but come with significant risks and require thorough research. Silver can outperform during bull markets with potential for dramatic stock price increases. If you found this helpful, please like, subscribe and hit the notification bell. Share your thoughts in the comments below.